I'd like to welcome our viewers today um, to meeting Steve Boggs. Steve has been practicing and teaching meditation for more than 40 years and has personally instructed over 1,200 people. Steve became involved in this work in 2002 and has been teaching since 2008. Steve, Steve lives in Fairfield, Iowa with Winifred, his beloved wife of 44 years. Steve, um, do, would you like to say anything more about yourself? Um, yeah, I could say by way of introduction that um, as I was preparing for this, it became clear to me that uh, I'm more in my element and I'm, when I'm alone for an extended period, working with words. In other words, I'm a, I'm a better, I feel I'm a better speech writer than I am a speech giver. But we'll see how it goes. So if I have to look down at my notes a lot, that's because why. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Yeah. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we live in a realm, a, a world of dualities, of, of polarities, each thing with its opposite, uh, up, down, left, right, dark, light, progressive, conservative, self, other, inner, outer, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And um, when an embodied awakening, uh, such as what occurs in this work, arises, it transcends uh, that duality. It becomes non-dual not to, in, this, in the sense that uh, the reality of those previous polarities and separations is revealed to not be ultimate, not the ultimate reality. And these opposites are then known to be a part of an indivisible whole rather than a, a set of contradictions. And how this works is that consciousness is our fundamental identity. And it's, it is you know, um, without qualities or delineations, it's formless. And because of that, it has no boundaries, no edges, no limits. It's infinite. And infinite doesn't mean a really large space. It means non-spatial, um, formless. <laughs> and um, a conscious nature is also, I would say, continual. Continual in that it just doesn't stop. It's endless. It's eternal. And eternal doesn't mean a really long time, is what I'm trying to say. There you go. And um, it's non-temporal. It's endless. And it's often pe easier for people to consider something that's endless than it is to conceive of something that's beginningless. But if it's non-temporal, it's both endless and beginningless. And both of these apply to our conscious nature. Um, it's, we could say it's always already present in all times. And um, my interest in this field in consciousness and its investigation and clarification began quite a while ago, back in the middle 60s when I was about 20. And um, at that time, I was, uh, happened to be in a, a uh, lecture hall with maybe two or 300 other people and listening to a sage who about four or five years later was to become known around the world as guru to the Beatles. But at the time, um, in this lecture, someone raised their hand and uh, asked a question and said, Maharishi, what is experience? And his response was, experience is the projection of consciousness upon an object. Mm -hmm. And this was a little different from my understanding at the time because it, to me it felt like at least my life had taught me that experience is something that just happens to me and it comes in from the outside. But this 
new understanding had seemed to have a kind of directionality to it and an active rather than a passive dimension. And this was the first of many shifts that occurred for me in my investigation and clarification of consciousness. And um, I, I got a little lesson in the fact that consciousness is actually what we are early in my life from my grandmother who once said to me, um, you know, Steve, I feel like I'm exactly the same person now as I was when I was your age. And at the time I was about seven and she was 70. And I was just incredulous when I heard this as a seven year old. Um, but now I know that there is in fact something that's inherent in all of us, which we can intuit and that is um, immutable, doesn't change. Our fundamental identity as consciousness is not affected by the movement of change or by the passage of time. Another little example is that um, almost no one of any age anywhere in the world, when they very first time, when they first, first awaken in the morning, ever doubts that they're the same person who went to sleep the night before. This is partly because the waking state of consciousness, the dreaming state of consciousness, and the deep sleep state of consciousness are three variations of one conscious nature, which is continual throughout all of those states. Even if the waker or the dreamer or the sleeper is not, it's not apparent to them. It's still true. And uh, sometimes I find in discussing consciousness, it's, it's, it can be more revealing to use metaphor and poetry than discursive speech. So I'd like to use a couple of those. And I'd like to say first that consciousness is like light. The visible spectrum from infrared all the way to ultraviolet is actually not something that we really see without a prism. We don't see light itself. We do see the effects of light. Mm. If I were to say, I see the yellow pencil on the pink eraser, it's actually the wavelengths of light. All except the yellow ones are absorbed and the, and the, and the, and the yellow one is reflected back, so I see it. So we know light by virtue of the objects that it falls upon, just as nearly everyone in the world knows consciousness by virtue of the objects that it's projecting upon. <clears throat> and also I'd like to say that in a way consciousness is like silence. If you're holding tickets to the fifth row in the center section at Carnegie Hall and the New York Philharmonic Orchestra is being joined by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir to perform Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And you've uh, moved through the first three movements of the symphony and you're about to hear the fourth movement begin the final movement of the final symphony of the world's greatest master of the symphonic form and the conductor raises his baton and waits. And the rustling gradually settles down and all the whispering settles down and eventually there's this breathless silence and it fills the concert hall from wall to wall and floor to ceiling just for a moment. Sort of like that. And then the baton takes off, the music soars and if you stay in your seat until the very end and wait until the last person leaves, you'll notice that once again, silence fills the hall. Silence was there before it started. Silence was there after it ended. But the truth is, silence was there throughout the whole time. Mm 
it was silence between the notes of the music. And it's actually the silence between the notes that gives the shape and form to the music. So like that, when a person awakens to their conscious nature and are stably awake in that, they are a silent witness to all of the motion and activity and phenomena of their life. You could say they're aware of the silence between the notes of the music of their life. And um, this state, this uh, piece that passes understanding is now the platform from which you are ready to take the next step into the wider dimension of your awakening. And that occurs when you recognize that not only is your particular identity infinite and eternal as consciousness, but that the whole world of the flux of phenomena of experience is of the same essence. And when that happens, a new and sometimes astonishing kinship with all things starts to take root. And everywhere your eye falls and lands on something that feels close and dear. And this is the real prize of embodied awakening that you've now discovered that there is I could say a field of love, a field of attraction, intimacy that is in many ways the end of alienation and of which you're never out of its pull. Gravity is present in all, all matter throughout the universe, throughout creation. And Gravity is an attractive force that's always drawing things into closer connection. It attracts things together. Gravity you know, certainly is like the arrows of matter. And like that, <coughs> this field of love which you now inhabit is constantly drawing things into closer connection, greater intimacy. And I kind of like the uh, um, expression I heard once from Terry Patton, who said that the awakened life can be a lot like entering into a, an apprenticeship to love, mm. which you'll never graduate from. And instead of graduating, you'll just be continually um, grateful to live in the presence of two questions. And these questions are, first, how much of this unfathomable love can I let in? And the second is, how much of it can I give imperfect expression to my life? And I'd like to say a few things to those of you who are living this throbbing communion with all things, which reveals to you the, uh, the wonder and the beauty of this world, as well as the devastation and the horror that's, that's uh, present in this realm. And um, I would say that the devastation that we witness in our world and the crisis of our world is also an urgent opportunity for all of those with this divinely human incarnation to enter into sacred engagement with the world. We often think, well, what can I do about the environmental devastation I see all around or, or how can I change the, the cynicism and guile of politics in this country? And what can I do about the uh, 
age-old and worldwide degradation of women. Well, there's a lot to do, but it begins with you where you are in your own life. What you have to offer to the world are the days of your life. And in your home, in your circle of friends, in your town, you can, your daily life, I could say, can become a template of loyalty, trust, kindness, clarity, that's noticed by others and emulated. You can be like the, what are called, I think, imaginal cells of a decomposing caterpillar inside of a cocoon. And around these imaginal cells, the new cells start to form the structures of the emerging butterfly. And this is how little by little and day by day and heart by heart, the crisis, the devastation of our world can be transformed through you. Each of you have a signature expression in your life and you have an energetic presence in the world. And knowing and living the the burn of this divinely human incarnation can be your hero's journey in this life. So I'm here to tell you, you are already a lighthouse shining through the night. So go get them. Do okay. so I think that's it? Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, so much for joining me today. I can imagine myself actually going back and listening to this recording again. The the territory that you covered is so rich and deep. I just share a couple of things that I'm can can carry with me right now was that sort of distinction between something like that eternal doesn't just mean something that lasts a very, very long time. That's kind of putting it back into the, the limited field by defining it as something that lasts a long time as opposed to eternal means it's time less. You know? right. So those perspectives that you offered a couple of times, I was thinking, oh yeah, I needed to hear that perspective because there was a part of my sort of smaller mind that wanted to see things like, um, like eternal dominion, yeah, a point in time that continues. And I, there I was narrowing it right there, even in my, my own unexamined definition. So thank you for those more, so much expanded, spacious definitions mm -hmm. that even as you spoke, I found myself dropping away of beliefs about what some of these words might mean and re resting in the truth of what these words mean. Yeah. So that was super, super valuable. And I loved your metaphors. I loved your metaphors. They were simple and easy to understand. And they also brought to me that, yes, we take for granted that, you know, that we all know about light when it's really something we don't know anything about, but we are living the impact of it all the time. Yeah. So you used a couple of metaphors like that that I helped me to go like, oh, consciousness too, of course. I really, it's, it's the thing that I don't notice. Yeah. And it is the thing though that um, like those, or those acknowledges like, um, it's that which is was with sleeping state of consciousness and dreaming state of consciousness and waking state of consciousness. We wake up every morning knowing who we are because something has continued, right. whether we examined it or not. Yeah. So you gave us some really beautiful, um, um, you know, gifts of how to hold some abstract ideas, mm -hmm. and then you gave us inspiration about how if we live the awakened life with conscious awareness, even in our own homes, in our own circles of friends, in our own communities, that we can make a difference. We can be the imaginal cells around which the other cells gather to produce a metamorphosis that we cannot imagine. Yeah. 
So I was really enjoying listening to you, Steve. And as I said, I've just made touched on a few things because of so many important things you shared with us that I look forward to listening to this again. Thank you so much. I'm really glad you invited me to participate in this. Yeah. Now, um, I want to let people know that, as Steve, we mentioned in the beginning, he is a Trillium teacher. We do have a, a website called TrilliumAwakening.org. And um, you can find Steve on that website. You can find his contact information. And he's written quite a few lovely essays. And I think some po poetry as well you have. I think it's mostly essays. Okay. But you write, I think of you as a poet because you <laughs> are, as, are, as a poetry, that your turn of expression is very poetic yeah. to me. So yeah, um, people can look for Steve um, in, your, in their own way. And um, other than that, Steve, are there any other closing remarks you have? Uh, no, I think, I think I've said everything that I have at this point. Lovely. Okay. Well, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank mm -hmm. you.